and welcome to our midweek gathering here at the Manchester Church of Christ. Um, grab a songbook if you'd like, or uh, watch the slides. Our first song will be number 535, The Glory Land Way. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before thee this evening, and we are so very delighted to be here. We're so thankful for that wonderful meal that our sister Linda made today. Um, thankful for the fellowship and all the laughter and just the sharing of our stories and uh, how our week is going. Um, Father, we ask that um, you bless this time of study and song. We love you and we love Jesus. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Number 57, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turn. Great. 
Good evening, everybody. Now, there is an axiom that you may have heard before, and I, I think is very true that we want to examine just a little bit tonight. And it's the statement that if you don't ask, the answer will always be no. And I really like that statement because there's a lot of truth to it. And whether it's asking to do something that you need permission for, or asking somebody out on a date, or even asking somebody for help, if you never posit the question, you never give someone the opportunity to say yes. You already know what the answer is going to be, so it's worth at least asking the question. And, and that's what this phrase encourages us to do, to actually ask these questions, because we don't know what the answer will be if they respond, but we do know what it will be if it's not asked. And recently, I actually had a, a chance to put this to the test in a very surprising way to me. So as most of you know, I work for Southern New Hampshire University and I work as an academic advisor. Love my job, love my company that I'm with. And my job is basically to take students from their admission all the way through their master's program until they finally get their degree and they walk across the stage. So in doing that, it generally takes them about a year and a half at the least to eight years at the longest. And in the process of time, I become a bit of a counselor and a confidant and even a, a coach of sorts to help them get through their personal problems and their academic problems in order to help them on their journey and in late December, one of my highest performing best students finally finished her program. And I was so excited for her because she had been working very hard, but also because she had some very big challenges to go through. She works in healthcare, so she was on the front line of the pandemic throughout the entire time of her time in school. In addition to that, she was pregnant and gave birth. She had some complications and surgeries throughout her time there. Her husband got sick and almost died and lost his job and had to change that. Uh, they live out on the West Coast, so their home was constantly threatened by wildfires and power outages and evacuations, and even more challenges on the personal side. But while dealing with all of that, she was also a perfect GPA student taking a full load of classes, working a bunch of overtime, started a new professional student chapter that she became the president of, and worked to mentor students all at the same time. And if that sounds like she's superwoman, she pretty much is. So when she finished her program, I asked her, what do you want the most out of this? And she said, the thing I want more than anything is to come to graduation. But because of all the challenges I faced, we're financially strapped and we can't make it. And knowing how important that was, I got an idea. When her grades went final, I went to leadership and I said, is there anything we can do to help this student? I wasn't expecting much because I'm just an academic advisor. I'm one employee in a company that has thousands of them. 
I have no authority of any kind because I'm not even in management. I'm basically on the bottom of the totem pole. I had no idea how they would react. And what I found out is that the reaction was more than I could ever imagine. After a couple weeks of conversations and looking into things, they actually decided to pay for round-trip flight tickets for her and her husband. They paid for two nights in a hotel, and they paid the cost for their rental car. Also, she could come and get the thing she wanted most, and to celebrate getting her master's degree. And last Friday, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with her and her husband for a meal and to share some time together in person after supporting her on the phone for a year and a half, almost two years. And I'll tell you, it was beyond whatever I could have expected because this was thousands of dollars that the university decided to spend to make this student's dream come true. And it all happened because I asked the question, can we do anything? Because I knew what would happen if I didn't, she would just sit at home. And I was thinking, because we've been preaching through things like the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been going through Ephesians in the Bible class at this beginning of the year, and I was thinking, how does this relate to us being Christians? Because this isn't just a pithy saying that sounds good. And I remembered in James chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says here, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and you cannot obtain, you fight and war, and, and notice what it says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Even God acknowledges you don't have because you don't ask, and, and that really hits home. Because if we just ask the God we serve, he's more than willing to give it. But it does go on to say, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. And this isn't to say asking God for things for ourselves is wrong, but there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. And truth be told, God already knows what we need. But sometimes he's just waiting for us to ask for it, to engage him. And of course, we read that in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and following, where it says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And even more than that, as I think about what the university I work for did for this particular student and how unimaginable it is if a university on earth is willing to do that much good for one person, we drop down to Matthew chapter 7. <laughs> because notice what it says starting in verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who knock, seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? If a university is willing to do this much good for one student, what on earth would God do for us? The answer is absolutely unimaginable, and I think it says it best in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So my encouragement tonight is just to keep in mind who we serve. And keep in mind that he wants us to ask, and that if we don't ask, we'll never receive it. And I know it can be hard because sometimes we're very prideful, and we think we can do it on our own, 
I know that sometimes we think our concerns are too small and we don't really want to bother God with it, so we'll just try to find another way to take care of it. And I think sometimes what we're asking for is so big that it's not that we doubt God's power to make it happen, we just don't see a way that it could happen. So we think it's impossible. But lucky for us, we serve a God who specializes in making the impossible possible and doing exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or ever think. So tonight, if you're a Christian and prayer life has slacked off and you haven't been talking with God and asking God for things and communicating with Him, I'd encourage you to get back into that habit. Cast your cares on Him, all of them, because He cares for you. And if you're not a Christian, God is, has something wonderful prepared that you didn't even ask Him for, which is salvation from sin and death. Something every one of us desperately needs and that can be yours tonight if you come and you obey him. If there's any need that you have, please let it be known as we stand and sing together. Seven fifty-three. <laughs> Tempted and tried. So Denise came forward and she wanted to let us know that her sister and brother-in-law are going through quite a hard time. Her brother-in-law Jerry has had a stroke and is in bad condition in the hospital and he's a super guy so we definitely want to keep him in prayer and uh, we want to keep Yvonne in prayer as well as she's down in Florida and dealing with this traumatic injury. And pray that they know it's from God. And hopefully it will lead them closer to Him. All right, so let us pray together. Our Father, we thank You so much that in this world many things seem impossible, but nothing is impossible with You. And You care so much about us that You reach down and take interest in our lives. You listen to our prayers. And You even sent Your Son to die for our sins so that way you could reconcile us and bring us back into a relationship with you. And Lord, it is so comforting knowing that we have the ear 
of the God who made the heavens and the earth and the ruler of all things. And we just ask for your attention tonight to be on Yvonne and Jerry as they are suffering, and Jerry especially as he's in the hospital with his stroke. We know, Lord, that you are a healer, and we also know, Lord, that you have a will that must be done no matter what we desire. And we just pray that our desires can be in line with that. And we don't know what the outcome of this situation will be. And we don't necessarily know why it happened. But one thing we know is that we hope it will draw them both closer to you. And that we can rally around to support them as much as we can. We thank you for the blessings that you give us. It is an honor to come before you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Every year, this auditorium seems to get longer. Just a few quick announcements this evening. Uh, You've heard these before. On Saturday, May 14th, there'll be a continental breakfast. Think finger foods. And for lunch, there'll be a soup and sandwich. Potluck on both Saturday the 14th and Sunday, May 15th. Uh, Charlie Jackson's... uh, Gospel meeting is just a week from Friday. It is rapidly coming. If you can help provide food, please sign up on the sign-up sheet at the back of the auditorium. There is also a flyer for the gospel meeting available if you want to disseminate it to friends, neighbors. If you can help with child care for any of the sessions on Friday or Saturday, please let Danny know. Uh, We need evening meals for the Texas volunteers who are coming in July, the 22nd through the 29th. Again, if you can help, there is a sign-up sheet at the back of the auditorium. And please remember the prayer requests from uh, Sunday. Doug Paul requested prayers for his brother Don, who had a blood clot. Pray that it dissolves and doesn't travel into his lungs. Cooks are still needed for Wednesday night cafe. Uh, The month of May still needs to be filled up. Do we? Is that true? Okay. I I heard a little buzzing from my, from this site. So I thought I had gone Jerry on everybody. (laughs) Uh, Ganderbrook is Memorial Day weekend. If you want to do work and worship, May, May 6th, this Friday, is Friday, uh, Friday night for the, uh, for the Father. And men, you've been warned, May 8th, Mother's Day, the life you save may be your own. Uh, May 15th, the gospel meeting, as already announced with Charlie Jackson. May 20th, family gay night, it's game night at 6 p.m. <laughs> it's a gay old time. Unless you play Yahtzee with me, then it's ugly. (laughs) Uh, And also remember Dave uh, Scary and his family's uncle Bob passed away, also his aunt Fran. And uh, see the bulletin for further. Ladies support group beginning at 7 tomorrow evening. Right here. Any questions, ask Any questions, ask the, the brain trust of the Campbell family, Kim. <laughs> oh, God, you are my God.
Good evening, everybody. Welcome into our Wednesday Bible class. We will be finishing up with Joshua chapter 9 and most likely getting into chapter 10 this evening. But as always, we'll get started with a prayer. So let us pray together. Our Lord and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to understand how relevant and applicable it is to us today. And we just pray for wisdom to discern good and evil. And we pray that we will take our practice in that matter seriously to understand how best to please you in this world. We know that we face tough situations on a daily basis, and sometimes the right answer isn't always clear, and sometimes it feels like there's no way to win. But we know, Lord, that as long as we stay faithful to you and we make a choice that would honor and glorify you, that all will be well. So we pray for that wisdom, especially as we look through this text and repeat again that wonderful encouragement to always seek you before we act, to see how well that works out in our lives. We thank you for being with us and guarding us and guiding us, keeping us safe from the evil one. We pray that you'd continue to lead us out of temptation and open our eyes so we can see the ways out when we get into it. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have when we can always come back to you. We thank you for that repentance that you enable us to have as well. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week in Joshua chapter 9, we started talking about the Gibeonites, and it all started with these five kings who wanted to get together, and they wanted to take on Israel in this last-ditch kind of effort because they saw the writing on the wall, and they knew that they were going to be defeated. So they said, we're going to put a stop to this, or we're going to die trying. And the Gibeonites had a little bit of a different philosophy on that. They realized how dire their situation was, and they understood no matter what they did, they would not be able to overcome the force of God. Not Israel, but God, because he was the one acting on their behalf. So they come up with this idea to go to Joshua and the leaders, and what do they do in order to try to gain favor with Israel? They came from a faraway country, they uh, wore old tattered clothes and brought moldy bread, and they were out of water to uh, make it look like they didn't know about much of going on and right. who they were and they decided they tried to get them to make a treaty with them. Yeah. Which they did. And it's very interesting because like if they had the Oscars back then, the whole group probably would have won the award for best performance because they really went all out. And it's interesting when you pit that against how the Israelites fared in the wilderness with God. Because their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They didn't want for hunger and food other than excessive you know, food and water that they didn't really need. So these people looked the part. And one of the lessons that we examined about that was how important is it that we test all things? right? Because it's not everything that looks good is good. Right? That's important, and especially when it comes to matters of religion, because what did the Gibeonites say in order to kind of drive home the point that it was okay for them to become servants of Israel? Just notice they're not asking for their freedom. They're asking to become servants. They uh Ask them for to make a covenant with them. Yeah. So they'll be safe there. All right. So they ask for the covenant. And why are they asking for it? What's their reasoning? They didn't want to die. They didn't want to live. Okay. Well, we know that because that's underlying everything. Well, they said they'd heard of the reputation of God and of his faith. <clears throat> yes. They said they heard of God's reputation. They heard of what he did in Egypt. They heard what he did to Og and Sihon. And remember, we talked about how they left out what happened to Jericho and Ai because those were relatively recent battles. And if they had been traveling as long as they said they had been, they wouldn't have heard about that most likely. 
So they were very crafty and very cunning, and they're coming under the guise of, we believe in your God, and we know the power of your God, and we want to be your servants because we understand who your God is and what he's doing. So we also talked about how they had to pretend to be from far away because they knew what the command was for all the people in the land, which was to kill everything that breathed. So if you pretend to be from far away, then ultimately you can make that covenant. Yes? They didn't actually say they believed in God, right? They said they, they heard of his name. Right. Yeah, yeah they had heard. the name of your God and all that he did. All yes. They didn't say they believed. But in a way, it is implied that they believed because they asked to become servants. So by submitting yourself to their rule, it's an acknowledgement that their God is stronger. And whether or not they actually plan to serve that God instead of giving up their idols is a different question, one that we'll address a little bit later on. But it is an important point to note there that they are not asking for anything special they are asking to become servants, so in a way, they are giving up their freedom. And this is nothing new. People today also pretend to be religious. People today peddle false doctrine pretending to be religious. They come to you asking money pretending to be religious, and then you give them money and suddenly they no longer show up. You know, these things happen even today, so it's important to test all things to see if it really lines up with scripture, because if not, we're going to end up doing what Joshua and the leaders did here. And I'll tell you, it's very hard because even like false teachers, even people who don't believe what scripture actually says, they've got enough truth in most of their lessons that it sounds right. And it can be very, very hard to pick out what is right and what is wrong. And that's why no matter who is standing up here, whether it's me teaching or Danny teaching or the elders up here or any other guy who gets up here and teaches, we all say the same thing. Don't just take our word for stuff. Look in the scriptures, investigate it yourself, come to these right conclusions. And if there's an error, we definitely want to fix that because we know how important it is to follow and serve God correctly. So they come and they give this performance and remember that Israel at least asks the right question. How do we know that you are not from nearby? So something in them was leading them down the right road, but then of course the Gibeonites dodged every single question. They were very vague about it. Well, we come from a very far away land. We've been traveling a long time. You see our bread, it's all moldy. You know, that must mean it's true. You know, that's not always the case. So they are performing, not answering the questions. And as we said there in verse number 15, Joshua made peace with them. And then in verse 16, it happened at the end of three days that they found out they were lying. I don't know if this was a Gibeonite person who just couldn't keep their mouth shut or if, you know, these cities were next on the list to be taken and they knock on the door to go take it down and it's like, hey, you look familiar, <laughs> you know. We don't know exactly how it happened, but we do know that Israel found out. And what is their reaction to this? The assembly grumbled against the, uh, the leaders. Yeah, the assembly, they're grumbling against their leaders, which is nothing new for this group of people, let's be honest. But at least in this case, it was for a good reason, right? So what is their concern? Why are they grumbling against the leaders and the covenant they made? They were upset because they weren't killed, which sounds kind of harsh, but in reality, the command was don't make covenants with people in the land. And they just made covenants with people in the land. And all of these people just saw what happened with Achan. Yeah. They, they knew what had happened when they disobeyed God. And now they're like, oh, we just disobeyed God again. So they're in the unenviable position of you're either sticking with breaking God's commands 
or now you're breaking the oath, which God also commands you not to break your oath, it doesn't seem like a win-win situation or like there's any way to win in there. But ultimately, what do the leaders decide? We're not going to touch them. It should tell us something about the importance of keeping our word and making sure that if we're making a promise or an oath, God expects us to keep those. Now, if it's a sinful one, that's very different. But whenever we're making a real oath like that, we just have to be careful with what we say and what we promise and really you know, let our yes be yes and our no be no and just kind of leave it at that. So the people of Israel and their rulers decide that we've sworn a covenant in verse 19 that we may not touch them. So this we will do to them. We will let them live lest the wrath of God be upon us because of the oath which we swore to them. And the ruler said to the people, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers for all the congregation as the rulers had promised them. So the Gibeonite deception had worked. They are now servants of Israel, and everybody is pretty much not happy with this arrangement, but they're going to let it stand. So then Joshua calls to confront them, starting in verse number 22. He spoke to them, saying, Why have you deceived us, saying, We are very far from you when you dwell near us? Valid question. We know that you did it, now tell us why. And I'll tell you, as people, we're really good at justifying what we do. We always have a reason why we're right and other people are wrong, or even why what we did, even though it was sinful, it was still technically okay. Right? We're good at that. But they at least have the opportunity to be up front. Because he says then, now therefore you are cursed, and none of you shall be freed from being slaves, woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. So they answered Joshua, verse 24, and said, Because your servants were clearly told that the Lord your God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid for our lives because of you and have done this thing. So notice Joshua's response here is, why have you done this? Because now you're going to be slaves forever. And their response is, I'd rather be a slave than be dead. Can we understand the humanity here? Can we understand why they would do something like this? Absolutely. Well, but you've got to realize, too, is that, you know, Israel was fooled. They were duped. And granted, you know... I'm not saying that was okay. okay? Mm -hmm. What I am saying is that they were also, they were con. Yep. And you have to be aware a lot of times, and it's a, a good lesson for us to look at and realize that, you know, when we were kids, we all did those kind of things, you know? Yep. We think nothing of it, you know, cross your heart, hope to die, I'm not going to tell this secret to anybody, remember that? No. Well. You know, you don't realize if you carry that through, <laughs> you know, there could be some repercussions. Sure. But, uh, you know, it's like like you said earlier, Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. And remember, you know, some of these lessons. Yeah. yeah. And it, here for us. They, they specifically got in trouble, remember, because God points out they didn't consult the Lord. That was their major flaw. Yeah. And though they did ask a question, how do we know? They, did, they never got an answer. They never got the answer, and they were okay with that. That's like somebody who works at a liquor store who's checking IDs. He looks at the picture and says, well, it looks close enough. Doesn't check the date of birth or anything like that. You know, there's at least a semblance of compliance, but if they had just kept asking questions or asked God like they should have, they would have found this out. So, yes, they, they got duped, but it didn't have to be that way. And I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've been duped and it didn't have to be that way. But it still happens and you still have to deal with those consequences. And now when we get back to this idea of did they believe in the God of Israel or not, according to what they're saying, it definitely sounds like it. They were clearly told the commands that God gave to Moses that they were going to be given all of this land and that everybody was going to die. 
and they at least believe that enough to come to Israel and ask to be servants because they knew that if they didn't, they were going to end up like the people of Jericho and like the people of Ai. They saw it demonstrated before them. So even if they didn't believe in God, they definitely believed in what was happening because that was real and that was tangible. So they explain themselves and then notice what do they do after that? Because they have owned up to what they have done. What's their next phrase that they go into here? Verse 25. Now here we are in your hands. Do with us as it seems good and right to do to us. What does that mean? Right, it's part of it. Yeah. It means you, you caught me and I accept the consequences. All right, you caught me and I accept the consequences. So if you're going to kill us, if that seems right to you because we deceived you, then kill us. And if you're willing to uphold your end of the bargain and keep that covenant to be servants, then do that. So now they're putting the responsibility back on the people of Israel because they have owned up to what they have done. And I mean, that, that hits me really hard because at some point before we all became Christians, we got to this point where we looked at the Bible, we looked at our lives, we looked at our sin, and we probably went, you know what? I deserve to go to hell based off what I've done. I can clearly see why I'm heading there. And God, it's up to you to do what you want to do in this situation. And how nice is it that we serve a God who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, prepared the entire sacrifice, made it happen, and we have that option. Like God's will is not for anyone to perish or not for anyone to go to hell. He wants us all to be saved. So when we find ourselves in that situation, or even after we become Christians and we look at our sin that we have, have committed as Christians, and we go, I am not in a good place, God, just, just do what you think is best. His answer is always, come home. That's always the best answer. Come home. Repent, turn, and live. And the people of Israel do much what God does. They showed mercy. And they upheld their end of the covenant. So there it says in verse 26, So he did to them and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, so that they did not kill them. So notice the people were still, let's kill them. They said that we could. I mean, they're essentially given the loophole here. That they said, it's okay if you kill us. They said, no, no. We're going to let them live and we're going to show mercy. Not that I respectfully have a different, I don't think they're saying you, you can go ahead and kill us. I think what they were doing is giving an unconditional surrender with the understanding that if Israel decided to take their life, that they would do that. Yeah. Because Israel was superior. They had, after all, they had God on their side that had they decided to go to war with them that they would do to them what happened with AI, what happened mm -hmm. with Jericho. So if it was a recognition from Gibeon that it was that they were in an untenable position to begin with. Yes. And, and so they, they surrendered. And, Absolutely. And as it turned out, uh, Israel did the right thing. Yeah, the, the leaders, they, they really led in this situation. And they said, we are going to show mercy here. So that day Joshua, in verse 27, made them woodcutters and water carriers for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord in the place which he would choose, even to this day. So by the time this was written, they were still serving in this capacity as slaves in Israel. And I do think it's worthy to mention that there is a very good comparison story to this that we at least want to take a look at because... This story and the story of Rahab are very, very similar, but they have different outcomes. So what was the deal with Rahab? Who is she? She thought 
prostitute, the comfort to, to the spies who were checking out Jericho. Yes. Knowing we, that she was committing treason to the king and her, yes. her country. All right. So we'll, we'll start a little bit with her background. She's a prostitute. How does God feel about prostitution? He says it's wrong in the law of Moses. He says it's wrong in the New Testament. It's a bad thing, right? She's also a Canaanite. And the command was, go kill all the Canaanites. Now, we also know she married into Israel. And remember, the command, especially in Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 5, is don't make marriages with these people. Wasn't she Ahab, Boaz, the situation? What's that? Wasn't she really the Boaz? Uh, later on, yes. She became part of Israel and, and gave birth and few generations down the road that would become Boaz yes so she was a Canaanite who was supposed to die she was a prostitute which God did not look on fondly she also remember she hid the spies which was you know a good thing for her to do at that point but she ended up lying and deceiving the people of Jericho and remember what was her reasoning for why she became you know, servants, or why she hid the spies. Do we remember? Because she feared God. She heard the story about God. Yep. She had heard God, and she knew the reputation, and I think it's worthy to read that in Joshua chapter 2. So you might want to flip over there, starting in verse number 8. It says, Now before they lay down, she came, upon, uh, came up to the roof, to them. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did there remain any more courage in anyone, lest you, for uh, anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So again, we've heard of your God. We know what he did in Egypt. We know what he did on the other side of the Jordan. Now notice what the Gibeonites have to say in verse number 9 of Joshua chapter 9. So they said to him, From a very far country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, who was at Ashtoreth. What do we make of that? It's the same thing, right? She hid the spies because she didn't want to die. They deceived the Israelites because they didn't want to die. They were also Canaanites who their Israelites were not supposed to make a covenant with. So just notice the similarities in these stories here that both of these people were Canaanites. Neither of them should have had a covenant made. Both of them had the same reason for why they wanted to be ingrained with Israel or make a covenant with Israel. And then down the road, Rahab in Hebrews chapter 11 is listed as one of those very faithful people. And then the Gibeonites go into slavery and are kind of looked at as very wrong. Two very similar situations, two very different outcomes. Because Rahab actually marries into Israel. She becomes part of the line of Jesus. I just find that very interesting. And I think probably what it has to do with is that Rahab gave up everything to be a part of Israel and to worship the Lord. And one thing we know about all the people who were left in the land and the people who ended up paying tribute 
is that they usually continued to worship their idols in addition to paying the tribute and things like that. Now, God never tells us exactly why Rahab is elevated and the Gibeonites are not in Scripture. But it is interesting to see that these two stories are very similar, but they do have very different outcomes. And, I mean, thank God he knows the difference. He's the one who ultimately makes that happen. But they both were part of the same group. Both lied and deceived. Both did it for the same reason, to save their own lives and their families' lives. And yet both of them were showed mercy. And that's just an awesome thing, because even all these people who were supposed to die, they got shown mercy. And as people who have sinned, we also deserve death as the punishment, but God has shown us mercy, and we get to reap the benefits of that. So I'm, I'm thankful for God for always keeping his word and for being a God who shows mercy. So the Gibeonites are now part of Israel to a lesser extent. They are servants of Israel and they get to benefit from being a part of Israel, which comes in handy as we start in chapter 10. It says there in verse 1, Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Does that change our perspective of Gibeon at all? I wouldn't be surprised, right? All we get is a very brief statement in chapter 9 about how they realized they better do something or they're going to die. And here this king is saying they are like one of the royal cities. They are bigger, stronger, more formidable than AI. All the men there are good warriors, and yet they came to their senses to realize that even with their power and their numbers and their skill in battle, they were no match for the Lord. So their actions were more out of faith than fear. Potentially so. Yeah, we don't get all the details. And I mean, I, I love more details on this for sure. But they knew what they were facing and they knew they couldn't overcome it. So therefore, in verse 3, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, the king of Hebron, and Piram, the king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, the king of Lachish, and Debir, the king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the children of Israel. Now that's interesting, because they're not going to fight Israel directly, so why are they turning their attention to Gibeah? At least one of the reasons, they're mad. They're mad that they're traitors. They could have fought on these king's side, but no, they defected to Israel. Like, now it's like, okay, we're going to attack them. I think part of it also might be that it's easier to pick them off than it would to be picking Israel off. So we can fight them. And then it's going to put Israel in a very interesting spot. You just made a covenant with these people to be your servants. Now they're under attack. What do you do? Well, I just want to go back to the reason I think. I got a note here, and I know notes aren't all scriptural. Mm -hmm. But if you recall, when Noah... Remember, got drunk, and Shem came in and kind of laughed at his dad, at his father. I want you to just listen to this. Noah's prediction that Canaan would someday be the slave of Shem, Genesis 9, 25 through 10, 26, has part of its fulfillment in this event for the house of my God. Probably specifies how the Gibeonites were to serve. The entire community worship at the tabernacle and later the temple required mm -hmm. much wood and water for the sacrifices and wash, washing and consequently 
a great deal of manual labor. From now on, that labor was to be supplied by the Gibeonites, perhaps on a rotating basis. In this way, they entered the Lord's service. Yep. I'm just throwing that in there because I think that prophecy was partially being fulfilled there. Yeah, could know? be. I, I know the Gibeonites weren't the only ones to end up serving. Right. But absolutely, that was a prophecy by Noah that, yeah. you know, Ham was the one who did the thing he shouldn't, and Canaan right. ended up being cursed because of that, which was a very interesting story all on its own. Yeah. And yeah, that they are actually fulfilling in slavery at this point. So, and that kind of altogether ties into what's happening here is now they're being attacked. So if you just made a covenant to stay at peace with these people and now they're your servants, uh, it brings up one of those moral questions. Like, are you morally obligated to defend your servant from an attack? You know, it, it said that Israel wouldn't kill them we never said like these other people can't kill you and we don't necessarily have to step in right so you can imagine there's there's some thoughts going on here as to what do we do it doesn't deter from the fact that they still lied they still deceived them oh they still did yeah okay and they were still wrong for that so they they had to pay for what they did sure yeah yeah now they're under attack not just by one kingdom but by a kingdom well several kingdoms all at once and, you know, they're being taken on. So, you know, what we have in verse number four is that they're saying that we're going to attack Gibeon. In verse five, notice that the five kings of the Amorites, all of them get their armies together and they encamp before Gibeon. And this is where we'll pick up next week that the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal saying, do not forsake your servants. Come up to us quickly Save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us. They are now begging for help from Israel because they understand they cannot withstand the force of these kingdoms. And they are hoping that despite their lie and despite their deception, that the covenant will hold strong and that Israel will come to the rescue. And major spoiler, they do. And the Gibeonites are saved, and in the process, we'll get to talk about the sun standing still in one of those stories where it ties in with the Devo, that if you don't ask, yeah, you never know what will happen, right? But if you ask God to help solve a problem, he'll do it in some sort of unique way, but he always comes through. And this is one of the more unique times that he helped out his people uh, with both the sun and the hail. So I'd encourage you to read through chapter 10. We will continue that next week as we wrap up tonight. Any questions, comments, concerns? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention. And Lord willing, we'll see you next week.